Okay, see if I can do this one hand. This is how you get into these radios. Uh, the bottom has a screw, and a cabinet screw, and you simply just undo this screw like so. And it's hard for me to do one handed here, but we'll get it done. I didn't realize how bad my coordination was, hand eye coordination, until I've done this. Okay. Oh, it fell out. Okay. As you can see, that screw has been removed. Then uh, it's kind of like works in the drawer. If you remember the old television, I think it was Xena for somebody, works in the drawer. Okay, so here's your mobile mounting screws. Okay, once the screw is removed, you back these out. And there's one, of course, for mobile mounting, there is one on each side. Okay, we'll back this out. And they'll have a little lock washer, and this one is missing it, but they also had a little plastic kind of a cushion to put in between the radio, so when you mounted it mobily, mobily, you could pivot it a little bit, it'd still be tight, and also to protect the radio cabinet from damage. Over here, you see the hole for the other screw. I don't have that in it right now, because uh, I was uh, did some crystal work on it a long time ago. But anyway, let's go ahead now, and I'll see if I can get this one-handed and we'll open the radio cabinet up and I don't know if I can do this with one hand I might have to put the camera down but anyway what happens is you slide this loose from the cabinet and uh, I'm going to put the camera over here in the front and see what happens okay uh, oh that's slipping like crazy I don't know if you guys can see it but here it is if you can see it and uh, you just, I just kind of pivot it like this. You, whoa, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Kind of pivot it like this. And then the works just slide out in a drawer. And I don't know what you're seeing there right at the moment. But I'm going to turn this up on its side. And I thought I had all the crystals out of it, but I don't. Okay. Now, this particular radio, and uh, this has been all cleaned up and kind of re reconditioned, and uh, let me see if I can kind of back this out a little bit. Uh, I can't really. Okay, this is a look from the circuit board on top, and these two boards on this particular radio one of these, let's see if I can get this set. This board here, one of these is a high band board and a low band board. And uh, let me see if I can get in close enough. And uh, look here. Okay, the front one, the first board there, as you can see, is the low band. And the board over here on the far side to the right is the high band. Okay, those boards, you have two screws in them if you look there carefully. And there's two screws in them. You could unscrew those and they plug into the main board. You just pull them out. And on some of these, when UHF came out, you could trade the high-low module, or the high or the low module for a UHS. For a UHF, sorry. Also, on this particular radio, though, this is your audio IC right here, and it was it's a big, powerful IC. It's got a heat sink, as you can see, and this has been replaced because when I bought this radio, the this audio IC was blown, and evidently somebody shorted it across, and like I told you, these are real sensitive to that, so you got your heat paste under there, and it's a standard chip. I used to... Uh, can't remember. It's been such a long time since I ordered it. And a friend of me and a friend of mine worked on this together, and I kind of got it back up. And uh, but anyway, there's the oval speaker, and this is a real high quality speaker. And uh, for its time in the day, and these were 
common, one of the, the problems with them, if you could call it a problem, was they had a hum in the audio. And uh, there's two, they list in their troubleshooting, there's two diodes and one capacitor that could cause that. Well, uh, for some reason that didn't always, those could be replaced and that didn't always fix it. So I had replaced some, I believe. We'll look here in a minute. And anyway, in order to kind of help it a little bit, I put a cap across that. I think that's about a 220 or something picofarad at, say, uh, 50 volts. And really, that's kind of like a crossover hookup. And that does take some of the bass out of the volume. And uh, But that capacitor bridged across there like a crossover. That took the, that cleaned the audio. And also, it, uh, kind of purified the audio being that works I if memory and what little experience I could call experience shows tells me right that works like a crossover so okay that's kind of an understanding of the main board and then here's your uh, see this is your volume control and it also has the switch on it this here is your scan manual control and it is literally just uh, rails like paper like a paper clip cut and that switch moves between those rails and that's how that's the different function that's a real simple way to to manufacture your own switch and of course here is just a standard pot for your uh, squelch now I'm going to turn this over and there's two sides to this of course and these were easy to get into to work on and here's the other side of the board and this is the side with your crystals and this gives you a little bit better overview and you can see your power supply transformer there okay now these had a real unique feature some of the beginning scanners uh, from Regency and uh, I think maybe Electra itself and just some of the other generic brands they had a set of programming wires here and they had three rows of pegs and you would you know you had like eight wires right there and you had or you had two you had two pegs and you would and it had channels numbered one to eight and you would take that wire and if you wanted to put a high band channel in it you would move it up and it would you would put it on the high band pin then you install only a high band crystal in that slot and you have you know a high band channel if you wanted a low band on the second channel you took the wire and you moved it up to the high side of it for the low band and so on and so forth on down the line till the radio was programmed well on these they did something different uh, as you can see these crystals are staggered okay and the two staggered ones on the bar it looks like they're on the bottom are the low band channels on this one and if you look up there and uh, what they done on these, you had three, three on the crystal, they're HU25 holders, and they had three uh, crystal socket connections in each, in each pair. So rather than have the wires, you have a center, which is the common. And uh, if it's a low band, you put, the, you put the bottom leg of the crystal across from the center leg to the bottom leg. Okay, these two are low, so you got low band crystals. If it's a high band crystal you put it in the same center leg but put the uh, outer leg of the crystal in in the uh, opposite side. So what they did works the same way same general principle uh, but they eliminate the wiring and keep it clean and, and uh, make it more simplistic and more well designed. And these crystal holders, I'm not going to pull on them because these are really tightened up. These are spring-loaded, and they were real easy to pop out. You could do these by hands rather than use a pair of tweezers or pliers. And uh, I don't want to mess them out, mess them up. I'd pull them out, but these work good, and they hold the crystals good. And I don't want to put any. The more you put them in and take them out, you know, the looser they get. So anyway, here's kind of an overview of the speaker and stuff. And then uh, they had some pretty good big capacitors in them back those days. And uh, But this here, this has got a shield over it because you have line voltage present. 
and of course uh, you know this is where it comes in from it's where it comes in from the mains and this was a square plug and I've got a hundred of those I need to dig one out for demonstration sorry but this was set up and I think this is the hot side for 12 volts and if I remember right uh, this is kind of crazy this was common for the AC and this is ground on that and it was this is all your connections ground ground and common for your AC and ground and positive for your uh, 12 volts and these would run up to 14 volts off of a car alternator or any other source and a lot of people that had these rather than use the plug would uh, just go ahead and they would take the bottom screw out and put a lug on it and just take a power supply and uh, put a little pushover lug on that and run them that way and these uh, the power supply in these was not real high tech uh, it had adequate you know if you look at it over here it's underneath these boards the receive boards and there again I'm not going to pull those because this radio has been worked over and I don't want to you know it's not hard you remove these two screws as you can see in them here on both sides you move this screw and that screw then this board you take a hold of it just pulls straight out it's got prongs it just pulls straight out well, underneath there is, you can see some of the circuitry for the power supply, which the power, you know, transformer itself is on the other side. And it's good, but it's not real elaborate about filtering things. And that was one of the downfalls on these. So many people would have a uh, certified 12-volt power supply to plug those into at home. And, oh, I want to jump back to what I was telling you about these, specifically in the beginning, being made for the Indiana state patrol uh, as time passed these were good and they decided you know they seen seen them when the patrol had them and they put them on the market along with Regency which done the same thing and there was a lot of other manufacturers some clones and stuff back then and but anyway they put these on the market for civilian use and they sold the heck out of them and they were quite high uh, when they were new if I remember right a radio like this I think uh, when I was a kid I liked to drove mom crazy for one and I had several scanners so uh, one summer and this was after my dad had passed uh, my mom said we're gonna go get one of these today for you and it was like three hundred and seventy four dollars and that's when they first came out there was no programmable scanners and the crystal control and the scanning the circuitry for the scanning which was basically a multiplexer and a counter chip but back in those days those two chips were like revolutionary they were space age technology and the idea of having a scan that you scan these channels and it would automatically stop on a channel with the carrier uh, display or, or receive the information and then move on and I'm not gonna power this up I've got several other scanner videos on there and you can go on this channel and look at those and understand how they work and uh, I may have a second video on this where we do go into that and do that but this is kind of a thorough review and like I said the idea of this channel is kinda of to help people if they uh, if they've got one of these and uh, are thinking of purchasing one as a vintage piece of equipment or something or needing help maybe they'll see something in my presentations that hey say this this is missing or you know even this is missing or something like that and you know like the wires were gone you know so I've got to find one of those or I got to know this and that that sort of thing but other than that uh, this was a heavy-duty scanning radio and uh, had your you know lockout switches here and but I love the styling on these and I love the sound and operation I love the sound and the way to they had a unique sound when this when the squelch closed under heavy squelch it was kind of a bump sound rather than a you know like a scanner like a uh, squelch and uh, but these they worked out real good and they were hurt 
by a lot of people on the consumer market that bought them because uh, other scanner radios would sometimes, now these would really fool you on a great big outside antenna on your roof. Sometimes they would, they weren't designed for it, but on a good outside antenna, they would receive as far as a Regency or, or Robin or one of the other models. But what hurt these was the very design feature that they built into it for the Indiana State Patrol was that 35 to 60 mile range. And people would get these and set them by a Regency or something. And they heard local things and I'll say 45 miles. But there was things 100 miles or so on the Regency they were get. Well, first thing you jump to, well, that's not as good a radio. No, that's not true. It's a more sophisticated radio. And those were designed to filter out long, super long distance communications. And the reason for that is, is the troopers have a bunch of radios going in their car anyway. And they don't need, they, they need to hear chatter that is uh, gauged to their area, like a 60 mile area. But they don't.